Hey everybody, if you're not familiar with the new FAA proposal for remote identification for drones, stick around, I'll give you a brief explanation of what's going on. Hey everybody, this is Charles Black with Draco Ariel. So right before the holidays, I got an email from the FAA about a new proposal that's out for remote identification for UAS. They want to start being able to identify our drones. If you haven't seen this yet, link is in the description below. Go read it for yourself. Now, to give you a little bit of information on it, 319 pages long. They put this out, and right now it's just a proposal. It's not in the law yet. So you have until March 2nd to go and comment on this new proposal that's out before it becomes law. But you know what? Let me give you a little bit of explanation of what's going on and who it's going to affect. Is it going to affect Part 107 commercial um, pilots, or is it going to affect the recreational pilots? Let's check this out. So let me give you exactly word for word right here what the FAA has for a summary on this. All right, so this summary. This action would require the remote identification of unmanned aircraft systems. Okay, pretty straightforward. The remote identification of unmanned aircraft systems in the airspace in the United States would address safety, national security, and law enforcement concerns regarding the further integration of these aircraft into the airspace of the United States, while also enabling greater operational capabilities. So, is this for the 107 pilots or the recreational pilots? Is this leading more to the delivery services we keep hearing about where drones are going to be used to drop off your packages you ordered two hours ago? Okay, so let's go over to the um, actual overview in this FAA proposal. So, this states, this proposal, this proposed rule would establish requirements for the remote identification of unmanned aircraft system, UAS. We know them as drones. Operated in the airspace of the United States. Remote identification, remote ID, is the ability of unmanned aircraft in flight to provide certain identification and location information that people on the ground or other airspace users can receive. Okay, now manned aircraft already have a system like this. It's called ADSB. And you have a receiver and a transmitter. Sends out, if you're in a manned aircraft and you're pilot in command, this system is going to send out your altitude, your heading, your speed, your aircraft identification. It's going to send all that out. Other aircraft control towers, they can receive all this information and know exactly where you're at, where you're heading. Thought this would always be a great system for drones. We actually looked at a system, just a receiver system. So when we're out flying, we know what manned aircraft are in our vicinity. Doesn't sound like a bad idea for safety. But again, still, who is this benefiting or working against? Is this in favor of 107 pilots? Or is this going to benefit recreational pilots? Let's get a little farther into this. Okay, so. Who is this going to affect? We're getting to it now. All, all UAS operating in the airspace of the United States. 
with very few exceptions. So there are a few exceptions. We'll get to who, what those are. So all UAS, every drone, with a few exceptions, would be subject to the requirements of this rule. So what this is saying is that all drones, with a few exceptions, are going to have to have this remote ID. Now, does this mean you got to go buy a new drone? We'll figure that out in a minute. All US UAS operators would be required to comply regardless of whether they conduct recreation or commercial operations. So this is going to affect everybody. This is going to affect the hobbyists, the recreational pilots out flying for fun. This is going to affect the Part 107 commercial operators. It's going to catch everybody. But again, there's exceptions. So according to this, the exception to the rule is going to be amateur built UAS, UAS of the United States government. So the federal government is going to be exempt from following this remote ID. So your law enforcement, your federal agents, they're not going to have to have this system. And unmanned aircraft that weigh less than 0.55 pounds. So your Maverick Mini is going to be okay. This proposal establishes design and production requirements for two categories of remote identification. There's going to be a standard remote identification and a limited remote identification. Now that's what really interests me personally. As a 107 pilot doing commercial work, I don't mind that they're going to implement new rules. But when we dig farther into this, these rules don't really work for where I fly and what I do. And I'm going to explain that to you here in just a second. Okay, but before we get into that, there's one other little catch here. Part of this proposal. So the FAA proposes to revise the registration. Okay, so the FAA is proposing to revise the registration requirements to require all, all owners of unmanned aircraft to register each unmanned aircraft individually when you're registering under Part 48. So what does that mean? Well, right now as a commercial 107 operator, each one of my drones has its own individual registration number. They're all registered individually. As a recreational pilot right now, you get one registration number and you put it on 100 drones if you have them. That registration number goes to you. According to this, right here, you're going to have to register each individual drone, even if you're a recreational pilot. So now the question is, how is this remote ID going to be working? And that's what's kind of bothered me. And again, you have until March 2nd to go and make comments to the FAA and express how you feel about this new proposal that's out before it becomes law. So instead of continuing to dig through this, um, I'm just going to hit a couple key points for that's really going to affect different individuals. So the biggest thing is this whole remote ID. It's going to be done through an internet service, through your data service. More than likely, it's going to go from the drone to your controller, through your tablet, your cell phone. 
through your data service, and that's how they're going to ID you. Where I have an issue, if you look at a lot of our footage, we do a lot of filming in very remote locations in Alaska. There is no data service. Our cell phones have no service. We do a lot of flying and 3D mapping, surveying in extremely remote parts of Arizona and Nevada for the mining industry. There are times I can be in my truck for two hours in the middle of the desert before I ever get a cell phone signal again. Where we're flying, we don't have a signal. So is that going to affect me? Well, according to this, and if you cannot match their standard remote identification, in which this whole process is going to be like the LANC system, it's going to go through a third-party app. And even in here, they talk about third-party companies charging $2.50 plus a month. Okay, so now you've bought a drone. Now, obviously, you're going to need to get a new updated drone. And now you got to pay a monthly service fee to connect for your remote ID. Now, these drones are also going to be designed that if you can't connect, your drone's not going to fly. And if your drone isn't set up to fly in these areas, or let, let me back up on that. If your drone's not set up with the remote identification, then you're going to be restricted to areas the FAA is authorizing you to fly in. So that means these places we fly in the middle of the desert, in the middle of Alaska, launching off boats out near the Gulf of Alaska. If I don't have data service and I can't connect to the internet, I can't fly. And obviously the FAA is not going to designate those areas as okay to fly. So I do have some issues with this, with the work we do. I'm curious of how you feel, especially if you're a remote, uh, a recreational pilot. And now you've got to fall under these new rules. And now you've got to get a new drone. The new drone isn't a big deal. So if this is passed into law, it's got 36 months to be fully implemented. So that gives you three years to get a new drone. Chances are you're probably going to go through a couple new drones between now and then. So getting an updated drone with a remote ID is not going to be a big issue, especially with what we do. We go through a lot of drones. We put a lot of um, time on our drones, a lot of air time. In fact, it's not uncommon for us to fly 20 plus hours a week on some weeks. So with that said, you've got again until March 2nd. I've put a link down in the description to where you can go and read this whole remote ID proposal. And there is also a link to where you can go and make a comment. Leave a comment for the FAA. Let them know how you feel about this new proposal for the remote identification. Safety-wise, the way things are advancing, we've been trying to get the Beyond Visual Line of Sight waiver. It's probably one of the hardest waivers to get. We're still working on it. I believe this is opening up the path to where we can fly Beyond Visual Line of Sight. But I see a lot of gray areas in this proposal that cause restrictions where we do fly now safely. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think this is a good move forward? Do you think it's an overreach from the FAA and the government and they should just leave us alone? Let me know what you think. This isn't the first time that um, the FAA has rewritten the rules for um, drone operators, and it's not going to be the last time. It's constantly evolving. It is a new technology. And until it is fully safe, like our airlines today, it's going to keep changing. All right. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you get notifications. We're going to keep these videos coming out. And until next time, keep flying safe.